We're back with another episode of Mommy Wines with your favorite wine mom, Emma Dawn. Tune in while she shares her motherhood experiences, introduces you to motivational and empowering special guests, and sips away your sins in the Mommy Wines Confessional. Mom life can sometimes get lonely and overwhelming, so she created this relatable, inclusive, and supportive space for us to be ourselves. Let loose, enjoy a glass of wine, and laugh. Get ready for today's episode. Here's Emma. Hello, 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 wine moms, and welcome back to another episode of the Mommy Wines Podcast. My name is Emma Don, and I am your host as always, and in today's episode, we are chatting with Parker Stevenson. He is the co-owner of Evolved Finance, a bookkeeping firm that specializes in online businesses. So if you're an influencer, a freelancer, or you have an online course, or you're a coach, whatever it may be, you're going to want to listen to this episode. We are going to be chatting all things money and finance along with their free budgeting and forecasting spreadsheet for businesses and personal finances. You can find out more about them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all at Evolved Finance, along with EvolvedFinance.com. Let's go hear what Parker has to say. (laughs) Hey, wine moms. Do you love wine? What about free wine? Or wine being delivered straight to your door, completely hassle-free? Oh, I know you do, because we are on the same page. The sponsor of this week's episode is, of course, my favorite Napa Valley wine company that gives back, and that's One Hope. Currently through your sips, One Hope has been fortunate enough to donate over $7 million to charitable causes around the globe, such as Alex's Lemonade Stand, a nonprofit on a mission to find a cure for childhood cancer, or Charity Water, an organization dedicated to bringing clean, safe drinking water to communities around the world, and so many more. One Hope has an incredible wine club that brings the carefully and thoughtfully crafted taste of Napa directly to your door. You can select a curated box or even customize one of your own or place a one-time order. The more you sip One Hope wines, the more rewards you earn and those are redeemable for discounts or giftable to an organization of your choice. You can even host a wine-tasting fundraiser to support a cause that's close to your heart. To do that, all you have to do is shoot me an email or DM me on Instagram. Link and details are in the show notes below. Now let's go ahead and get into the show. Hi, Emma. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm so excited to have another bookkeeping expert on the show today. I know there's uh, not a lot of us, let alone ones that have upbeat, outgoing personalities (laughs) like we have to the extent that we each have our own podcast. I know. I'm excited to hear more about your podcast because obviously your podcast is more business focused. Sure. While this is like my outlet of like creativity because there's only so many numbers I can take in one day. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um but let's do a little introduction here um everybody hi welcome to the show i'm your host as always emma don and in today's episode i have part is it parker stevenson yep correct perfect the one of the founders of evolved finance a online business specialty bookkeeping and development practice yeah, it's in, it's in essence, we do bookkeeping for online businesses, but also provide a little bit of business advising and guidance to help them understand their, their numbers more deeply. Now, I'm really interested in hearing more about the online specialty you guys have, because when I started out in bookkeeping, it was all construction. And then I've just kind of carved that out as like my expertise. Um, But now I'm really noticing that even some of my auto shop clients or retail clients, they're getting more into this online space where they're doing social media or they're opening online stores. And it's 
been interesting, like learning more about it. I've really dived in like, or dove, I've really dove in to learning more about the differences that online businesses have compared to regular, just brick and mortars. Um, but you're the expert. So I'm excited (laughs) to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, no, I, I was very lucky. My business partner started the business back in 2010. Um, and kind of fell into the online space. And when I say online space, like uh, our, our clients are kind of in the business of selling information. So our clients are, they have courses, membership sites, they have coaching programs, whether it's one-on-one or group coaching programs or some sort of mastermind. Um, Some of them are influencers and maybe they're entertaining and building audiences and then they get sponsorship income. And then we have a few online service providers where um, their, their, their service isn't like necessarily like a landscaper. It might be like Facebook ads, or they have a VA agency, like their, their service kind of revolves around the online space, a lot of marketing agencies and things of that nature. So that's what we mean by, you know, online business, at least for us, it's a lot of the times a a business owner who's working from home has a remote team around the country. And they're, they're like, like online education. A lot of them are really going to be based around the online education. But I think Emma, like for you, what you're doing, having a niche, I think is so important for any type of business, because for us, um, we've been able to become expertise, like experts and build an expertise around online businesses. So everything we do, all our systems and processes for how our bookkeepers work, how our account managers work with the clients are based around one business model that we know really well. So we can kind of speak the same language as our clients and we can understand the insights and, and the norms, the financial norms for our, our clients. And I think regardless of if you have a bookkeeping firm or whatever your business does, having that niche allows you to speak and serve, speak to and serve your, your customers so much better. So if like you get into the construction space, like word gets out, other construction construction business owners might talk to other colleagues and then you can build this expertise in this niche. And then operationally, you can get really efficient at working with construction companies or whatever it is. That is is so what happened. I didn't pick this niche on my own. It's not like I went out there and I'm like, you know what? I'm only going to work with hard hats. Like (laughs) if, (laughs) if I had my choice, I would work solely with like boutique wineries or like Mm. coffee shops, like something cute. You know, I definitely, it, the niche found me. I definitely did not hunt for it because it's exactly what happened. Like you said, like people used my services or, um, I actually started out helping out a boyfriend's company because mm, okay. the owner's wife got pregnant and she's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I feel like that's how all of my clients come to me. The wives kind of take over the bookkeeping side. And then they're like, you know, this isn't fun. I don't want to do this. I have other things I need to do. I don't want <laughs> I definitely don't want to do this anymore. And then they come to me. But it is like that. It's all so many. And even like some of my other clients who are in service industries, it's so much about word of mouth. Like I barely ever advertise my business. I might do like a flyer once a year. Um, I just, I moved to Northern Nevada. Um, I'm originally from Cleveland. So I did a flight, like a mail flyer um, when I first moved here. And that's been it. It's all yeah, word I mean, of mouth. That's the same thing for us. I mean, Evolve Finance hasn't really done any hardcore marketing. I do workshops and presentations with like our clients who sometimes have an audience. Like we're lucky that a lot of our clients do have audiences that are a fit for our service. So we do some kind of like, I guess, referral promotions with our clients, but we've never really done advertising really even our social media. Like we have social media. I don't know how much it works or helps <laughs> anything because every new client that we have come on is 99% of the time is like, Oh yeah. So-and-so works with you guys says great things about you. I want to work with you too. And we've built a very healthy business off of that. And again, I think that comes down because we're in this niche, in this niche, other business owners, no other business owners, you build a reputation. Um, People are always looking for who's the best copywriter. Who's the best Facebook ad manager. Who's the best bookkeeper. Who's your accountant? like whatever it may be. And we've just been doing this long enough. And I think 
uh, it may sound like bragging, but I think have built up such a good reputation for our business as well. That is just for each new client we get, we have bring, uh, that we bring on, they are just another person that if we can win over and give them a really great experience to just someone else who can be an evangelist for us. Right. And, and, and preach the word of a full finance to their friends and just bring more people, you know, more potential clients to us. So um, that's why I think, you know, depending on the type of business model you have, what sort of business you're trying to run, um, sometimes you don't need sophisticated sales funnels and Facebook ads and all this stuff. It's just a matter of picking a good niche, doing really good work, and then sometimes not being afraid to ask someone for a referral, you know, like giant real estate, uh, real estate agent businesses are built around just referrals. So um, we're oh, very definitely. lucky it's worked out. We're lucky it's worked out well for us in that way, because my Instagram game is awful. Um, you know, our social <laughs> media game is awful. So if we were relying on social media for our business, we'd probably be in trouble at this point. Oh my gosh. My Instagram, I don't really have social media for my business. I've kind of taken on this title of the home bookkeeper. So Mm -hmm. like anybody who even reaches out to me about my services on social media, they're reaching out because they're like, they see like the behind the scenes. And that's something that is changing in business also is through my podcast, I'm able to work with some wine companies, not from like a bookkeeping side of things, but more just like a promotional kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. they're getting on social media and they're sharing so much of like the behind the scenes of like their family's wineries or their pets outside in the vineyard and things like that. And I feel like now we kind of went through this like robotic phase of social media, but I feel like now it's kind of getting into like a relatable aspect. People like to see that kind of stuff. And I've noticed it a lot with like, um, like boutiques or like retail shops that have gone solely online, especially through the pandemic. Um, People like to see that kind of behind the scenes stuff. They even like to see it with my podcast. They're like, we love listening to you, but what goes into a podcast? And I'm like, well, I'll show you, check out my stories. (laughs) Yeah. And that's something I think I've had maybe some mindset issues around because I'm like, uh, we're so focused on this is what we do. This is the problem we solve. We're really freaking good at it. If, if this is what you're looking for, let's go, let's talk, right? Like it's a one lead at a time, one prospect at a time, let's turn them into a client. Um, but uh, for me, I think, well, if you're not in the market for a bookkeeper right now, then why would you follow a bookkeeping company on, on Instagram? or, you know, joining the Facebook group. So our podcast has been a really great way for us to have something where we can show our expertise, we can deliver value. um, But I don't do, and maybe it's just, maybe my business partner and I, we don't really want to show a lot of behind the scenes stuff in our lives because it's like, well, this is our business. Like we have a whole team of people that are doing work and supporting our clients. It's not like Corey and I are doing all the things, but why would you care what we're doing anyways? But that's something we see a lot of our clients do. They they kind of open up and they show, (laughs) yeah. And they show more about themselves, but like their families, what they're doing, what they're interested in. And for me, I just don't think I've figured out how to connect the dots between here's me walking my dog and join our bookkeeping service. So that's (laughs) something I think going into next year that uh, I'm going to have to figure out or at least think about a little more. Yours might be a lot different because I've kind of carved this whole brand out of like because I've been in finance for 10 years and I did not start out in bookkeeping. I was a manager of a bar, like a pub and grill all through college. And with that came a lot of bookkeeping, a lot of inventory tracking, a lot of employee scheduling. So they're like, well, if you could do that, you could definitely do this. It's not that hard. And so I did it. And I, and then like, they started talking to so-and-so and like, one of their tile guys wanted to start his own tile business. So he then stopped being an employee and became a contractor. And then he's like, well, I need help. And then, like you said, it just kind of grew from there. But now being like the home bookkeeper, it just makes so much more sense for me, like in my brand to show the behind the scenes. Because like we also homeschool. 
So Mm. like, luckily my son is, uh, only four years old, so he can't give out any private information, (laughs) but but like, there will be times where I'll be like, okay, find $2,001. And he's like, okay. And he'll like, look at a bank statement and he's like this one. And then he'll highlight it as I'm reconciling in QuickBooks. Nice. And so who knows, he might be the, the next home bookkeeper. Um, (laughs) Well, and, and your story is very similar to how we started though, too, because my, uh, my business partner, Corey and his wife, they were working for a lawyer in LA where I'm in San Diego. They're in LA. That's where they grew up. And, um, he was working for this lawyer, him and his wife doing personal assistant work. And then they started working out of her law office and then she sold it to start an online business. And, um, and the online business started to take off and no bookkeeper understood. I mean, this was back in 2008, 2009. Oh, she couldn't find a bookkeeper that actually actually understood how online businesses work because they were still kind of new. Like, I, I feel like back in 2008, I was still like hesitant to buy things on Amazon. I'm like, I'm going to put my <laughs> credit card information, you know? So it was like, it was, she was very ahead of the, the curve. And so uh, she was struggling with the bookkeeper and Corey, I think is just very operational numbers minded. He was like, well, why don't I try it? And so started doing it. She met other online business owners. They asked her who was doing their bookkeeping. And so she started referring business to him. And then those clients referred business to him. So that by the time I got involved in the business, by the end of 2014, he had like a backlog of people wanting to work with him. And we, he had already built up a reputation, again, in this very niche industry. Right. Um, so I think, again, there's this, um, there's this very undervalued um, aspect of entrepreneurship where every, you know, a lot of new business owners want to kind of be everything for everybody that sometimes it's like, no, just pick a niche <laughs> and start there because you never know where it's going to go. Um, and if you're good at what you do, people are going to talk and it's free marketing versus, um, you know, we have clients where they probably get some referrals, but if you're in this business of selling courses, you might need to sell, you might need 50 people in your course every month. So word of mouth isn't going to work really work that way. So you have to develop more sophisticated marketing strategies, which is fine. But when you're just getting started out, it, it's too, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a lot to ask of a new business owner to just go and figure out a Facebook ad strategy. It's like, well, how can you start to generate revenue in your niche with your expertise? A lot of times I think a service is the best way to start. Um, because again, you can, you can bring in consistent revenue and and do so, um, without having to also spend a tremendous amount of time trying to figure out how do you promote this thing? It's like one client at a time, serve them really well and (laughs) they'll talk about you. Hey, wine moms, working moms, Corporate moms don't want to be in debt moms. Children are older moms. Got to pay for college moms. All moms, listen up. As the cost of living rises, debts increase. In the pandemic of 2020, more and more families are looking for professional yet flexible career opportunities. I have been asked so many times how I am able to be a solo, homeschooling, stay-at-home mom, and it's all because of bookkeeping. Yeah, (laughs) you heard me right. Bookkeeping. Now, it may not be overly thrilling or an adventurous, flashy career field, but it's safe, secure, dependable, in demand, and how I have been able to support my son, our lifestyle, and survive the lockdown while also having the flexibility to travel, explore, and spend more time doing the things we love. As more people get creative, tech startups take off, and more companies being open to the idea of outsourcing their administrative positions, this gives women like us the opportunity to earn more, work less, and around a schedule that accommodates all of our other spinning plates. As the head of my business financial services and development firm, EDJ Consulting Group, I have created the Home Bookkeeper Masterclass, where I share with you all of the lessons that I learned while starting and scaling my very own remote bookkeeping business. Become a home bookkeeper today. The details on how to enroll are all in the show notes below. As many of you know, finance is my profession. When I'm not here laughing, sipping, and chatting with all of you. I have over a decade of financial industry experience, and financial wellness is such a passion of mine. Like many things in the world, finances tend to look a little differently for women, 
even in today's generation. Webull has simplified the stock market and investing game with an easy-to-navigate, zero-commission platform that has free real-time quotes, multi-platform accessibility, 24-7 online help, and extended trading hours. If you're looking to increase your financial portfolio and set up your retirement IRA and start investing in yourself, click the link in the show notes below to receive two free stocks on me. I know the classes are the hardest for me. I created the Home Bookkeeper Masterclass and it's done fairly well, but I'm like, I cannot figure out a sales funnel if my life depended on it. If somebody was like, you need to figure this out or we're going to like chop your limbs off or something, I'd be like, (laughs) oh, take them. Just go ahead and start. Uh, (laughs) It's also pretty terrible because I want... Have you ever seen, well, you might not have seen it because you said you're not like a social media person, but there's this reel going around and it's like a guy and he's like terrified, like shivering in the corner while this woman is watching this documentary. And it's like, and it's like true crime documentaries, how like women Mm -hmm. love it. And (laughs) this guy's like scared. And I'm like, that is one of the weirdest things that I do. And this might be my confession for this episode. Is when I'm working, because I do have my son here at home, he's loud, whatever. I'll put my headphones on in my computer and I'll listen to these like true crime podcasts. And he's like, and her legs were chopped off and her eyes were gouged out. And I'm like, oh my God. And like some of the times I just sit there and I'm like, I'm really listening to this. Just like doing, like going away, like (laughs) doing what I need to do. Do Totally. But um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, so there's this YouTube, they're a family vlog channel that I listen to, and they recently started a podcast and it's about all of the behind the scenes of running their online business, whether it be like with sponsorships, their YouTube AdSense income, um, and then everything that they have going on behind the scenes, which is like an online storefront and all of this. Well, in their podcast, I was listening to one of their episodes. Uh, I think it's like one of their most recent ones. And they said that they were three years behind on their taxes because their accountant was doing their bookkeeping. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can totally do this for you. It's fine. Whatever. You need to fill out this form, whatever. Um, He ended up not knowing how to do the taxes and all of the prep and all of the stuff that goes into their online business. And it turns out that he never filed for them two years in a row. And Uh. so in their episode, they were talking about how the wife has like no emotional attachment to cars. So in order to pay their fees and their back taxes, they like sold an Audi R8 (laughs) to pay for all of this stuff that they had to pay. Um, and I, I just thought that was so interesting. The entire time I was listening to this episode, I was like, why didn't he like tell them? Why didn't he like try to find someone? I was like, because one bookkeeper, one accountant knows at least one other bookkeeper or accountant. Like there's no possible way that you could just not know anybody else in your industry anywhere in the world. Right. So I'm like, he just failed. He just didn't file. He just didn't do anything. Um, and in the episode they were talking about because they bought a different house and they rented out their old house and they kept getting letters sent to their old house, like from the IRS. Um, and yeah, I just, I wanted to ask you what makes, because this is your special space, (laughs) um, what makes like the accounting and the bookkeeping side of online businesses, especially with like now this new age of like influencers and all of that, how does that differ from like a regular, just like a regular 
traditional business, like a landscaper or a coffee shop? Well, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the way that these businesses collect money. Um, it's not necessarily super complicated, but a lot of the times you have these businesses collecting revenue through um, Stripe, for instance, or PayPal. Um, and so a lot of the times these uh, uh, bookkeepers or accountants, they just, they, they're, they're not really willing to go into those softwares and figure out how does it work? Mm. Because, and this is why, again, if the theme of this episode is going to be about something, it's going to be about niching down. Um, <laughs> because what happens is like, think about your bookkeeping business as, as bookkeepers. And this is a big reason why we've niched down is if we just worked with any business that came our way, like a restaurant is going to be very different than like a dentist's office. Right. A dentist's office is going to be very different in terms of the business model than um, a laundromat or a bookstore right? That, that some of these businesses have inventory or manufacturing business might have cost of goods to build their actual physical product before they even sell it or even put it in inventory, right? Like all these different types of business models have different sort of financial complexities to how they operate that um, most book bookkeepers will just work with any business that comes their way. And there's just no possible way as a bookkeeper, you're going to know all the intricacies of the fi and the financial makeups of any business that comes to you. So what ends up happening is you're going to kind of do a crappy job for everybody instead of doing <laughs> a really good job for one type of business. So I, I think with accountants as well, um, a couple of things we've seen, this isn't for every accountant, but it is a theme we've seen. Accountants, number one, tend to not be great bookkeepers because they make their money off of filing taxes. The bookkeeping's just a necessary evil for them to be able to file the taxes. So a lot of the times, they, even if they have a small bookkeeping team, there's not a lot of systems around it. They're not super organized. It's just like, hey, this client needs the books done so I can file the taxes, figure it out. I don't want my bookkeeper to just figure it out. <laughs> I want them to be confident. Just like if I had a construction company, I'm like, I'd be like, Emma, you know, construction companies for the love of God, do my bookkeeping. Cause I want someone who knows how my business works. So if this accountant is just like, well, I'll just take on whoever to file the taxes. If they get in a situation where like, Ooh, I need to do the bookkeeping in order to file the taxes. And I don't really understand what they're doing. And there are a lot of accountants out there who are a little old school. The idea of a YouTube influencer is very new to them. That's a concept they've never really understood that when they see income coming in from YouTube or from merchant accounts, and then they have expenses that they wouldn't normally see a business owner spend, then they have to do all this research to figure out, well, is this part of the tax code or can we write this off that they have to like everything going on in this business, they have to do double the work because they have to research everything they're doing because they have no expertise in it. So a lot of the times, unfortunately, accountants have more business than they know what to do with anyways, that they'll just be like, ah, never mind, And just like drop you and not even let you know. And they'll just literally like ghost you. We've had clients where it's like my accountant's oh. ghosted and it's yeah. ridiculous. And so while I do want to put some blame on the accountant, I would also say that when you start your own business, you have these extra responsibilities, right? You're not just like waiting for your paycheck and all the taxes have been taken out and you're good to go. Like everyone knows when you start your own business, the, the government's going to want taxes. <laughs> so for this, for, so for these influencers um, to have been making a lot of money and, and knowing they haven't paid a tax bill in two or three years, and maybe they were hounding their accountant and their accountant was giving them the runaround, but it's your responsibility to make sure you have the right people helping you in your business. Because if you haven't, if you're sitting on all this cash and you're like, Oh, I guess we're not paying taxes this year. It's like, of course you have to pay taxes. If you haven't seen any checks go out to the IRS or to your state, that's a red flag to go talk to your accountant and go, uh, what's going on here? Why haven't we filed taxes? Especially if they're buying Audi R eights and really <laughs> making a lot of money, you know? Right. Um, but this is why it's so important to bring people. If you're a business owner working with people who understand your business model, so you can as much as possible, avoid these situations. Cause you want people that are going to, you're going to be working with who are like, Ooh, yeah, let's dive in. I know exactly what to do here. You don't want to work with people who are like, yeah, I want your money. And I guess I'll just figure it out as we go. Like that tends to not be a very good situation. 
absolutely. I just, I also think it was funny because they're like, well, we had $24,000 set aside in a savings account. Um, and then if they're buying they, Audis. That's probably not enough money, by the yeah, way. Yeah. And then they get their tax bill and they're like, so we sold an Audi R8 um, <laughs> and sent the IRS our $24,000 to pay for like all of these fees and like late charges and obviously the, the taxes that they owed. So I, I thought that was a really interesting episode. Um, because I was well, like, what they need, there's they needed so to many find people. Us is what they needed, Emma. They should have found Evolve Finance and uh, understand someone that understands the bookkeeping side. Um, so then they actually would know before they even go to their accountants. Because that's a big part of bookkeeping is you can help them estimate for taxes because they're, you're tracking their profitability on a monthly basis. So I hope they learned their, me- their lesson and they have better support <laughs> now because that stinks to like sit there and like have this huge tax bill. It's, I mean, that's not fun. That's really scary. It is super scary, especially because they're a family vlogging channel. I was like, if somebody came to me and hit me with a giant tax bill, I would be like, oh, my, I would just freak out. I would freak out. <laughs> That's not fun. Um, and then also you actually touched on the next question I had a little bit was, A lot of times I will get clients who come to me and they say, my accountant's overwhelmed. They want me to hire someone or, you know, so-and-so told me about you, but I already have an accountant. I don't know why I would need a bookkeeper. What do you kind of have to say? Like, what's your opinion on bookkeeper? Not, I I don't want to say versus accountant, but why do businesses need both? You touched on it a little bit which is just the fact that accountants file taxes. They don't necessarily do the books. Um, They can, and they're fully capable of doing it. But like, what is your take on when somebody, maybe you have like a consultation with a client and they're like, well, we already have an accountant. Well, this good. Yeah. So to kind of reiterate what I said before is, you know, a lot of the times accountants, like they're trained to do taxes, like to file the tax return and that's how they make their money. Um, And also accountants are trained to understand tax law and tax code and make sure that businesses are being compliant with what's being written off and and, and ultimately be the decision makers around what things do we get to write off in the business. Bookkeepers are more data specialists. That's really how we look at ourselves at Evolve Finance. Someone has to take the transactions that are going on in your business in the checking account, the credit card, PayPal, the merchant accounts. These are the types of things at least our clients are, are dealing with. Someone needs to take those transactions and put them into bookkeeping software and organize them in a way that the accountant can then file the taxes. And then the business owner can also understand what the heck is actually going on in the business. And so a, a big part of bookkeeping is again, knowing the business model, knowing what, where to put these transactions so that you can start to categorize them, right? Like a good bookkeeper is going to know how to categorize these transactions so that you understand as the business owner, where is my money going? Number one, how much money am I bringing in? And what of my, what are my offers? Which of my offers are bringing in the most money? So for our clients, if they sell like four different courses, well, Sure, we could just put all sales in a sales category, but we want to show them how much money is coming in from each one of those courses because that helps them to know where do I need to double down? Maybe I don't need to sell one of these courses. There's information there that helps them make decisions. Um, And then from there, there's these expenses. What are they spending on advertising? What are they spending on their team? whether it's contractors or employees, what are they spending on their software? So then we have all these categories that we've built up over the years to use specifically for online businesses so that it's not just these general tax categories that mean nothing to the business owner. It's like they actually understand what these categories mean and how they're relevant to their online business. Again, that's something a lot of accountants don't really think about because there's already so much work to be done with the tax side of things that again, for the accountant and their bookkeeping team to really build out proper bookkeeping processes and to have niched down to where they're going to know how to 
do the bookkeeping for the type of business you run. It's just a lot for one service to be able to do. So I get it. It's very biased and very self-serving to say this, but I truly like, even with my, if, if I wasn't, if I didn't have a bookkeeping business and I was doing something completely different, I would want a bookkeeper who every month is only concerned with organizing the financial data and ensuring that the data in the bookkeeping software is correct, that it's accurate. There's no duplicates. There's no missing transactions. There's no weird transfers that weren't matched up and, and mistakes were made. I want to know that the accurate, the, the data is accurate and it's being organized in a way that makes sense for my business. And then at the end of the year, and hopefully you're not waiting until the very end of the year to talk to your accountant. Hopefully if you're a robust business, you kind of have a relationship with your accountant. So they answer some questions, maybe as they come out throughout the year, but then when you get close to tax time, the bookkeeper hands off the books to the accountant, which is exactly what we do. And then your accountant can sit in their zone of genius of just making sure the taxes are being filed right. And that you're not paying more in taxes than you legally have to. Like that's what you want your accountant solely focused on. Now I know some accountants are like, well, I, I, we have to do the bookkeeping because I only trust my bookkeeping team to, to do the books. Um, I get that um, because there are a lot of bookkeepers and I don't know how many times I'm a, you've inherited another bookkeeper's books and you go, what the hell was this bookkeeper doing? This is a hot <laughs> mess. Um, so I, I would say it's three the times in the last six months. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very real memory for you right now. Um, and we see that all the time too, but I've, we've also seen that some of the worst books we've ever received are from accounting offices where they had bookkeepers in there um, doing the books, but again, not feeling like there was a real ownership and a real dedication to providing a customer experience on the bookkeeping side. Because I think what's hard about our industry is a lot of accountants and bookkeepers um, don't really want to have to explain things to their clients, right? Um, they just kind of want to get the work done and move on. And, and I think that's a real shame because I think that forces business owners to be like, I guess I'm not going to pay attention to this. You just do it. And I'm just going to trust that you do it right. Um, but I think as business owners, we have to take more responsibility for our businesses, uh, at least not to the extent where we need to be able to file, file our own taxes or do our own bookkeeping. That takes a lot of specific education and skill to know how to do. And time. But, oh, tremendous amount of time. I don't know. None of my business owners have the time. And it, I feel like just the time also, like it would just burn them out if they were wearing every hat in their business. Like they're, they're not, but they're not going to do it right. But it's yeah. like it takes them a bunch of time and they're also not going to do it right. We've had one client who came to us and did their own books and it was perfect. It was better than any other bookkeeper I've seen do it, any other accounting firm do it. It would she had a VA business and she was a VA and so she's just very task oriented and she did stuff that were like I don't know how you figured this out but it's exactly right. Other than that, 99% <laughs> of the other businesses did not do it right. We work currently are working with 165 um, businesses and growing. So and we've worked for 10 years with a variety of other businesses that have come and gone one. We're talking one. So that's where it's like, sure, maybe if your business is really small, maybe you're doing your books in a spreadsheet or something like that just to begin with. But once you have more transactions in your business, than you can keep up with in a spreadsheet, hire someone who's a specialist. But again, for whatever reason, just some of the worst bookkeeping we've seen comes from accounting firms. So if you're running your own business, I do think there's value in having a bookkeeper who knows your business model, who understands what kind of business you're running, and they are held accountable for doing the books properly every month, then again, that allows you to have a different relationship with your accountant where it's just about taxes. And then you hold them accountable to, you know, make sure they're actually filing your tax bill every year. Unfortunately, <laughs> that YouTuber did not have quite the same experience we would like them to have, but then it's like, you're, you're splitting up the responsibilities in your business to the experts that need to be experts to get those tasks done. If you have been listening for a while, you may already know that my nonprofit, Sterling Lives, has finally been approved and we are now going through the long, nerve-wracking process of funding. Our mission is to assist the youth aging out of the foster care system while they transition into adulthood. Through sustainable tourism, youth are able to earn an income, to save for their futures, live in safe, eco-friendly and affordable housing, focus on mental and physical health, attend group workshops, higher education, and career training. Our goal is to grant youth a safe place to heal, focus, and grow. Though federal funding opportunities do exist, 
We still need your help. Our GoFundMe link is included in the show notes below. Any and all donations, link shares, and Sterling Live's merchandise orders are greatly appreciated. And of course, feel free to give the Sterling Lives organization a follow on Instagram. There you can stay up to date with news and all that we have going on, along with future builds. Thank you so much. Yeah, def- I love that. And I've seen it just like you've seen it probably just as any, if there are any other bookkeepers listening, they've seen it. Um, and I did, I went ahead and I checked out your website. And I think one of the things we both have in common, even though our bookkeeping practices are so different, um, is we just, we both focus on education And that education is something I have noticed that my clients really appreciate. Some of them are taken back. They're like, you want to sit down and like, talk to me about my profit and loss statement. I'm like, yes, (laughs) yes, I do. (laughs) This is necessary. Um, So I, I don't know. I think the education is really important, especially if there's like little things that they could do to make their day easier that they can even do on their own, even to save them money. If they're like doing three steps and really they could only be doing one or something like that. I think the education is really important. And like the overview of, or the reviews of the different statements. Cause they're like, oh yeah, we would just get like a, an end of the year profit and loss. And I'm like, nope, you're going to get all the management reports every month. <laughs> so you know, cause God forbid they have to go to the bank and file like a, for a business loan or last year we were doing all those PPP loan applications. Yep. I was like, it was a disaster. And so many businesses before the pandemic, I know it kind of hit all at once, kind of suddenly like a train wreck. <laughs> um, but there were so many businesses that had no idea where they even stood financially. And then the and then the pandemic happened and they're like, are we going to survive this? And I'm like, I, I would think mo- the majority of most businesses don't know where they stand. I mean, when you think about all the small businesses operating across the country, I, I would be willing to bet that the majority don't really know where they stand each month. And I noticed that the, the education is a really big part of, I notice on your website, it's what kind of sets you apart. So well, what kind of reviews or maybe even just the financial education on the business side, do you do with any of your clients? Yeah. I mean, the one thing about our industry, and I kind of touched upon this already is there's this, I guess, story that's told that money's hard and finance is hard. And as a business owner, it's going to be too difficult for you to understand. And I think it's perpetuated by the people in this industry, um, which If we're being honest, a lot of accountants don't get into the accounting field because they love socializing with other human beings. They want to dive into the numbers, file the taxes and not interact with you. And we've met some really phenomenal accountants. I think that's changing that sort of perception of accounts are changing. But historically, especially in the U.S., we don't like to talk about money. It's a faux pas to talk about money. There's a lot of shame and negative feelings revolved around money. And uh, again, I think the finance industry in, ge- in general, and I think a lot of it being rooted from like Wall Street, they want to make it feel like this is too complicated for you to understand. Just let the experts take care of it and, and you just run your business. And frankly, we think that's bull crap. Um, because especially for our clients' businesses, their business models are really straightforward. The hard part isn't the understanding the numbers. The hard part is the bookkeeping. And that's what they're paying us to do, to know how to reconcile and organize the data in a way that they can then look at and understand. So uh, when I first got involved in the business and when we were a much smaller business, Corey and I did the same thing. We started off doing monthly calls with our clients um, because it allowed us to learn more about their businesses and allowed us to uh, get a sense for what what's difficult for the clients. Like, what are they struggling with? What do we need to teach? And, and how can we get even better at analyzing profit and loss statements so we can create like a framework 
for how we want our clients to look at their businesses. And again, we're able to create a framework because we only work with one business model. There's no way we could do this if we worked with 10 different types of businesses. Um, we have one main business model and we're able to create this framework around what should your profitability be? What should we be spending money on in terms of labor versus advertising? And uh, what are our goals from a revenue standpoint? So what we've been able to do is we have a very high touch onboarding process. And as part of the onboard, uh, onboarding process, there's this educational aspect that comes along where they get a strategic call. We go over their PL with them and we go each month. These are the things you need to, you need to look at. These are the things you pay attention to. After that strategic call, they get access to a client learning center where we have a lot of other learning material for them to go through that's relevant to their business model. And then we have group calls on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So my business partner and I are available as, as well as our account managers to just answer questions as things come up for our clients. Um, so we're able to create the support structure that as our clients need us, we're available to answer those questions and help them make decisions. And you know, a lot of the times a client might come onto a group call and be like, Hey, can I afford to hire this person? I'm thinking about bringing on this person. Is that, does that look good to you? And they know they have someone that not only understands their, their industry, but also has looked at more PLs than they could ever possibly imagine. <laughs> so we can see this stuff very quickly. And so we're even doing more. Uh, we have a lot of plans to even develop this educational piece even more and make this framework even clearer for our clients. But what we found is that it sets better expectations with the clients and makes our clients feel more supported their businesses grow more because we're helping them to understand their businesses more deeply. So they make better decisions. And as their businesses grow, we can charge them more money because we have, we essentially have a tier system for our pricing where once you hit certain revenue goals or you, or you hit certain revenue tiers, then our price goes up like a hundred bucks a month or something like that. So, um, so if they grow, so does our business with them. So it's like we're incentivized as well to make sure we're giving them good advice and, and teaching them the things they need to know so that, everybody wins. And so it just makes the clients easier to work with because they understand what we're doing more. Um, they feel more appreciative for what we're doing because we're not making this more confusing. We're making it for the first time for them less confusing. Um, <laughs> and, and again, because there's so little conversation and so little education around money in general, not just in business, like most people are awful with their money personally, let alone running a business and trying to manage the money there that for us, that's like really our, our mission is like, how do we make this less complicated? Um, stop pretending like we're fancy experts. Like, no, like what I'm sharing you is very simple. It's adding and subtracting and, and some percentages. It's not hard. It's just, we want to be that that um, first experience for our clients to go, oh, you got the bookkeeping covered. You're helping me and understand what my numbers are mean are, are meaning. Why did I think this was so difficult? Why did I think this was so scary? Um, I'm going to go off and make as much damn money as I possibly can now. And that's really <laughs> what we're trying to free them up to do is go make the money and know that you have this framework to to be able to look at your profit and loss statement and be able to know like things are going good. It really is good. And if things are not going so well, it's not just, Oh crap, the sky is falling. It's like, no, here are the areas that you can work on that. If you work on those areas, you can get things good again. And that's where I think as business owners, we can sometimes feel a little like things are out of our control or things are happening that we don't know what to do. That when we learn how to interpret the data in our business, whether it's finance data, marketing data, whatever it is, that's the business giving you feedback going, Hey, this isn't going well. I, j I just want you to know, like, come fix me. And when you have that feedback to go, okay, well, I know how to fix that. That's not a big deal. Let's go. You become so much more empowered and you're making more confident decisions when you feel like you're not just like throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what works. And that's what we're trying to do <laughs> is a little less spaghetti on the wall and a little more making decisions from tangible feedback, tangible data in the business. Now, a lot of my audience and a lot of the people that I've even had as guests on the show are kind of even whether they've tried to make it work or they've stumbled into it, a lot of them are now in this online business space, whether it be um, an Etsy shop that's blown up or mm -hmm. they've become an influencer, you know, throughout the start of TikTok. Um, <laughs> so what advice do you have for people who are kind of just starting out and not sure if they need to like outsource just yet? Yeah. I mean, 
the one thing I always say is that if you're deciding to start a business and you're going to be spending money on it, you're making investments in the business. One expense you just have to accept is going to be there every year is hire an accountant. And I say that as a bookkeeping firm where we don't file any taxes. So it's probably um, not in my best interest, but in the interest of small businesses, just don't file your own damn taxes, please. If, if you're making any amount of money, just understand you're going to spend anywhere from a thousand to $3,000 a year um, for a medium quality accountant to file your taxes for you. That's going to be worth its weight in gold. Otherwise, I'd say on the influencer side, just because I find this business model so so fascinating and seeing our clients kind of leverage it is because, and especially I love comedy podcasts and I've seen how comedy comedians have been able to monetize an influencer business model by having a podcast, having, um, you know, Instagram following and Twitter following and all that. You have to have an offer, right? Because what we've seen is that, sure, if you have a really, really big YouTube channel or something like that, you can make money off of that there's google ads and you'll make money and sponsorships can be great um but you really have to get to a big big level for those sponsorship deals and for that ad revenue to really make a living and then you essentially have this business model where you're at the whim of the social media platform you're on on whether or not you're going to continue to make money and have an audience because if they cancel your account or shut it down your whole business goes away. So I mm. think that social media and in this influencer business model creates opportunity to build businesses, but just because you're making money doesn't mean you have an actual business. It means you have a revenue stream, but a business is something where you can predictably generate revenue. You have systems and processes in place to keep that revenue coming in on a monthly basis. We have systems and processes in place to be able to handle the HR, the finance, uh, the customer service, the marketing, you know, and we have something where we can invest back into it to grow and scale the business. And so that's where this influencer business model has been very interesting and why so many influencers will then figure out, okay, I need to develop, um, merch or I need to put on live events or I need to sell a course or I need to write a book. Having an audience oh so you can make somebody it can make some <laughs> money but monetizing that audience is, is the big key thing. And so if you're not uh, a, an influencer and you don't have much of an audience yes and you're and you're just a small business owner, I, I think the same is true. Like do you have a clear offer? What are you trying to sell? And I think that's where a lot of new business owners try to do too much and have too broad of a market where, and they go, oh, I'll do anything for, what do you need? I have all the services. And it's like, what we've found with our clients is that they get really good at selling one thing. Like they have one main offer and they sell the absolute crap out of it. They go, <laughs> this is what I do. This is the problem I solve for my customers. Um, I solve it really well. This is the program or the course or the membership site or um, whatever they're kind of, however they've kind of packaged their offer. This is the offer that solves that problem for you. And, um, and this is what it costs. Is that worth, is the problem I'm solving for you worth the amount of money I'm asking you to pay? And usually the value that their customers get from being in their programs is far more than what they're actually paying. So Usually the answer is going to be yes for most people, but our clients are just very clear on who are you serving and how are you solving a problem for them? And I think that's where influencers can sometimes get in a weird space because they, because for instance, we had a client who had a smoothie blog and absolutely crushed, like had a massive audience, right? But it took really? them a little I love while. That. Oh, massive, probably one of the biggest, and we have some people who are pretty famous as clients who have really big audiences. And they had like one of the biggest email lists that, that I think any of our clients have ever had, but it took them a little while to figure out, well, how do we make money off of this? Like, how do we like, we're, we're giving away free content essentially every month on our blog. So how do we build a business model around this? And then that took them a little time to figure out, well, what can we sell that people are going to be willing to pay for and it provides value. So that's where sometimes people think, oh, I just need a huge email list or I need a huge social media following or whatever. And then I'll make it. And the reality is we have clients who have tremendously smaller 
email lists or social media followings, but they have seven figure businesses. They absolutely crush it. So it's not about how many people can follow you. It's about are the right people following you? And are those people a good fit for whatever you ultimately want to put in front of them? Does that make sense? So getting off social media. So having some kind of service or offer or tangible product, that's the business. And then the- yeah, email list is still everything um, because, again, uh, we've had clients who have like these, maybe they're relying on Facebook ads and they're crushing it with these Facebook ads. We actually just had a client, one of our, our uh, bigger clients who uh, runs a really great business. There's nothing controversial about them whatsoever, um, but for some reason, Facebook just shut off their ads. And they were like, like they said, oh, you're breaking a violation. And, and they're like, no, we're not. <laughs> And so there's all this reliance on Facebook and and I know it's stressful for them, but they have a massive email list too. So it's like, yes, this puts a, it's definitely an issue they need to fix, but they have their email list and they have audiences other where and other places that they can still put their offer in front of and promote to. So that's where, again, a social media marketing strategy can be phenomenal, but it's still like, especially our influencer clients, they need to be able to take that social media following and put it into an email list or put them into a funnel that then puts them into an offer. Because again, a lot of the times, especially like we have clients who are YouTubers, the amount of time and effort that goes into making YouTube videos is tremendous. And a lot of the times when they start to get big, they need to be able to hire video editors and they need to be able to hire people to support the business so they can create more content. So now all of a sudden they're this content creation business, but if the only revenue they're having come in is from their advertising, um, that really limits their growth potential. And, and it doesn't allow them to sort of scale the business in a way that isn't them grinding away, making videos every single week and, <laughs> and grinding through all the work that puts, I mean, uh, the, for me personally, having a YouTube channel, it seems sexy on the outside, but it sounds like one of the most stressful business models you can have. But that's where you're seeing a lot of like YouTubers actually getting sponsors for their videos and starting to sell courses or creating um, merchandise lines or whatever it is and finding other ways to make sure that they're not just relying, relying on that ad revenue. And they're also taking their customers from, like we have some clients who get a lot of organic, organic traffic from their YouTube channels, but then they're pushing them to their website and getting them to opt in on their email list. So, but the reason they're able to do that is they know what they want their customers to buy. They know the type of customer they're bringing in. They know they're a good fit for what they have to offer. And then they're good at getting that offer in front of them, right? Like that's where it's just, again, having an audience isn't enough. We need to have a strategy around how do we monetize this audience? Whether it's getting 10 people to your website every month, or getting 10,000 new subscribers on your YouTube channel every month. It doesn't really matter. We have to be strategic with where, where are we trying to take this customer? What's the customer journey we're trying to take them on? And what do we want them to actually buy? See, I'm so glad that I think it was interview connections that connected us because uh-huh. so many people guess on the show, um, listeners of the show, they reach out to me because they know that unfortunately podcasting isn't my full-time job. I also run my bookkeeping practice. So me too. I, I, I wish podcasting <laughs> was my only job, but I'm right there with you. It's fun, right? Podcasting is fun. Um, but they reach out to me and they're like, uh, so for example, one of the guests that I had on the show is, has this amazing, amazing, um, mommy kind of crafting Instagram page. And it has exploded since she was on the show. She has, she went from, I think when she was a guest, she had 1200. Um, and now she's pushing 20,000 and she's constantly, and I don't know what it is about crafts, but she's constantly getting reached out to by like Joanne fabrics, uh, Michael's Walmart target cricket, all of these things. And she's like, I don't know like what to do. <laughs> and I was like, she needs to come talk to us. I'm like, our I we can wish I could help you because I don't know what you should do either. <laughs> I'm like, besides like 
actually like going through the steps of establishing a business, I could definitely help you have like, of course, do that. I'm like, but now I have you as a resource. And um, another one is a wedding videographer was Mm. on the show. And over the pandemic, obviously, there were no weddings, they were all canceled. (laughs) So so let me let me guess, can I guess? they made a course or did online classes on doing photography or videography and now they're crushing it. Did I get it? No, they went to TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told her that's what she should do. I'm like, you have to do like a beginner like class or like some kind of webinar or do something, have some kind of membership or something. And she's like, she's like, no, I just make, cute TikToks with my dog. And I, <laughs> I'm like, but they are getting millions of views. And now really? there's millions. And now all of this ad revenue is coming in from TikTok's creator. And she's been posting her TikTok videos on Instagram, which that has gone up because Reels is like an algorithm situation. And now all these people are reaching out to her, not only to like, do their wedding because they don't have kids yet. It's her and her husband. Um, so they just all travel together and she does like destination weddings, which I think is really awesome. I'm a little jealous. I was like, I wish I could be like a destination bookkeeper. Like, (laughs) 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 like you need me to go on location and like Bora Bora. Okay. Like, I guess I can clear my calendar for you. Um, But yeah, and I'm like, and it has grown her videography business, but she reached out to me and she's like, so what should I do about this? Like, do I create a new, like a new entity? Do I do like a, this is this? And I'm like, I I can help you with like the steps of establishing because I have done that many times. Um, I'm like- that's kind of the same for any business, right? The start is kind of the same for everybody. I'm like, but the actual like, back end finance part of like a TikTok business. I'm like, I have no idea. Well, I, Emma, I, that's where we'll talk after the podcast. Cause <laughs> I would love to, um, cause we, we, we have a finder's fee. Like we send referral fees to people who send us business. So, um, but, but I think what's interesting about what you're talking about is exactly the, why I we're so passionate about what we do. Cause we actually in the last six months have brought on a lot of like most of our clients are female, like, and a lot of them are moms who start business at home and then they take off, but crafting parenting blogs, like just have blown up. And so these are people that like, yes, they had the intention of starting a business, but an online business can grow so fast that it becomes, whoa, what do I do? And you all of a sudden have to learn all these rules to the game of business much faster than maybe you're originally thinking you needed to do that. That's why, you know, a lot of why we do this is because we're helping regular people who just started a wonderful business that maybe went beyond what they were thinking it was ever going to be and answer these questions for them. Right. Like, and, and, and get, make this a little less um, cloudy because so much of the time, most business owners, and depending on where you're at, you know, for anyone listening with your own business, all you're probably worried about right now is how do I make money? Like, how do yeah. I drive <laughs> revenue? How do I get more sales? Right. Um, but eventually you get to a point where you go, oh, we're making money. Trying to find new customers isn't my biggest concern. It's what the hell do I do with my money now? It's this whole new, uh, I call it like the two games of business. Game number one is learn how to drive revenue. Game number two is learn how to manage the flow of money through your business. And it's game number two that catches people off guard because they're like, oh, I kind of didn't plan for the part where I make lots of money and I have to figure out what to do with (laughs) it. And that's where, again, I think it's kind of a shame that in our country, it's just, there's not a lot of resources around this. Like there's not a lot of support for like, okay, let's not just get your finances together. Let's also teach you how to understand this and teach you how to understand the, the movement of money in your business so that your business stays profitable. You can pay yourself an awesome salary, but you can also protect the business and make sure the business is, um, is 
safe so that it can continue to pay you. I can only imagine I mean, the amount of times you've seen business, you know, especially in the construction and mechanic world and stuff like that, where the business owner is taking every damn dollar out of the business um, of profit that they can, and they're never sitting on enough cash. And then if they have a bad month, they have to take on debt. It becomes this very volatile business to be able to run um, that for, for us, that's where the education part comes in and the, and, and the expertise in these niches, because we can try to make that a little less stressful. And we feel like we're setting an expectation with the relationship where we can go like, Hey, I don't think you should be taking that much money out of the business. Right. And, and they <laughs> expect that, which is why it's so important. I think in today's day and age that there is more financial education because Lord knows, I mean, how many new businesses got started during the pandemic, like, Oh my gosh. Home, so online many online businesses, especially. Yeah. And, and they're like blowing up, but again, there's just not enough. I think people in our industry finance professionals that know how to support with that. So I'm hoping that, you know, that's something we're obviously trying to change and, and support with. Um, but I, I, you know, we're making it kind of our mission to make financial education a little more um, accessible. Um, but, but I hope we're not the only ones doing it because I think, uh, small business is just going to continue to grow in this country because it's the internet's making it a hell of a lot easier to do it than in, ever before. That's for sure. I feel like education is probably 50% of what I do with my business owners. I've had, you know, old colleagues of mine reach out to me and they're like, you know, aren't you afraid that they're going to take this on their, start doing it themselves or, teach somebody else how to do it. And like, then you're going to lose that client. And I'm like, well, no, because I feel like if, if they leave and teach somebody else how to do it, whatever, then I feel like that client was going to leave regardless. Um, but I feel I've noticed that the more education, the more we talk about things, the stronger our relationship gets because then they are, totally. like you said, more comfortable. And I don't know what it is either about this whole um, secretness or like uncomfortableness around money, especially talking about money. Um, but as I've gotten, you know, more into the relationships with my clients, they sometimes talk to me a little too much now about money. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm like, it just kind of like, once that floodgate opens, it's like, okay, well, maybe we don't need a, a tsunami. Maybe we just need a nice little stream. <laughs> but, 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 you might, but you might be one of the only people, Emma, they actually have open and honest conversations with about their financial situation, both for their business and their personal finances. I mean, even when I was in the corporate world, no one talked about how much you make. Like, you don't say what you oh, make. Oh, that was you so ask, hush, you don't, hush. You, don't, you don't ask your boss, how much are you making? It's like you talk to HR and you just hope that, you know, when you get a raise, it's fair compared to the rest of the company. And there was actually a study done in the UK uh, that said uh, people there would rather talk about their sex lives with a stranger than <laughs> their fine then their money and then talk about finance or money which oh, is mind-blowing especially and that's where i think there's so much like culturally there's so much value around well how much money do you have like we we are we not value but we um base our personal value like how much like our worth is based on how much money do you make? And if you don't make money, you suck. And if you do make money, you're the best. Well, we all know there's lots of people who make lots of money who are complete jerks and a-holes. <laughs> and there's people that don't make that much money who are wonderful, amazing people. But I think in our society, how much you earn is such a big deal that there's shame if you feel like you're not making as much money as you should be. So then you just bottle it up and keep it between you and your spouse and don't talk about it with anyone else that again, even with our, our group calls that we have with our clients where other business owners are hearing, uh, hearing others talk about the things they're going through and making financial decisions and stuff like that. It, it just makes it less intimidating, makes it uh, less of a big deal. And especially when there's no judgment there, it's like everyone started off in the big, you know, like our clients, have to be making at least a hundred grand a year or more to be able to work with us. So everyone who's making a hundred grand, 
um, understands that the businesses that are bigger than them at some point was making a hundred grand a year and then they, they grew. Yeah. Um, and but everyone has to start somewhere that when you go, Oh, this is where you're at. There's things to really appreciate about that and things to, uh, that you can take advantage of while you're in this situation, but there's also plans for you to be able to grow and make more money. And, and that's really cool too, but there's no shame wherever you're at in your process, but we love to compare ourselves to other people so much that we always just feel so bad going, well, I'm not Amy Porterfield, so I'm not making as much money as she is. So I must not be um, doing something right. And it's like, no, there's not very many people as successful as Amy Porterfield. But if you're making half a million a year and have $200,000 a year in profit, that's a hell of a lot better than the majority of people in the country. But again, I, I, these are the conversations that I, I just hope we can start to get a little more used to having as, as a society, because um, I think there's a lot to be gained from us being more open about money, having more conversations around money so that we can all hopefully develop better habits with our, our money in the long run. Well, go ahead and share with everybody listening where they can find you um, online, your business, and if you are, like you said, on social media. Yeah. So the best place to go for us, if you're curious to um, either learn more about our services or even want to get a little more education, um, Evolved Finance, E-V-O-L-V-E-D, Evolved Finance. Um, we have a great free workshop that we um, uh, we give access to for free and we give away a free personal budget and a free business budget. So especially if you're kind of running more of an online business, I highly recommend you go to our website, check out the workshop and get those free tools. And then I also have a podcast called the bottom line by Evolve finance. I'm usually talking for 15 to 20 minutes a week about, again, some of these things behind the scenes that, you know, sometimes business owners just aren't aware of just trying to educate and inform uh, online business owners about the things that maybe they aren't aware that they need to be paying attention to and how to understand the financial sides of their business a little more. So those are really great places to start to learn more about the things we're trying to teach our clients. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being my guest today. Emma, I appreciate you having me on. This was fun. I could talk about finance stuff for forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me. If this was, if we wanted to do a three hour podcast, I'm sure it'd be very easy. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mommy Wines podcast. Make sure to leave a rating and review. And don't forget, if you're listening on YouTube, to give this video a big thumbs up and make sure to subscribe. And feel free to share this episode with your friends. Be like, hey girl, just listen to this super awesome and relatable podcast from Mommy Wines. Here's the link. To the episode. Have fun. You know. And to support the show and keep it growing, snag some MWP merchandise available at themommywines.com. You can also find all of my wine gadgets and my favorites right there under the shop page. For even more tipsy content, follow Mommy Wines Podcast on Instagram. On IG, I go live with real wine industry professionals. I try new sips, connect with all of you wine moms, and share some pretty funny memes if I do say so myself. All sponsor info and links will be available in the details below. So until next Wine Wednesday, mamas, parent and drink responsibly.